Hi, welcome to Extreme Academy part seven. Welcome again and welcome to all of you. If you've been with us from the beginning, thank you. Thanks for your engagement. Thanks for your attention on this training. Now, I wanna give a special thanks to all of you who reached out to share your story. And if you still want to do that, then please do. You just have to drop us an email. Uh, we'll show the email address on screen somewhere uh, or just reply to one of the emails that we've sent you as part of the registration process. Um, just share your story. Let us know what are you trying to do? What are your aspirations? Where are you trying to take your career? What's your current circumstance? And if the Extreme Academy is helping you uh, achieve those aspirations, then uh, we'd, we, we'd love to know. Because what we want to do is we want to share your story in our social media activity within our blogs. We want to share it with the wider uh, uh, community of the Extreme Academy and encourage our others, to, others to join you. I'll encourage other people to try and do what you're trying to do. Thanks for all your comments and feedback on the, especially on the chat window, by the way, you know, the extreme team is really enjoying you know, see, seeing your comments. We're trying to, we're trying to keep up with it in the, in the chat window. Uh, if you have a question um, and it requires a longer answer, then ask that question in the app. So you'll see the, the URL appearing on screen uh, over my shoulder. Also lots of time, lots of times during the actual training itself. That's where you need to go to, to meet up with the extreme team to ask, longer questions to get longer answers. Um, so the Extreme team are waiting in the app to answer your questions. Now this week, we're, we're covering something really, really important. We're covering security, uh, IT security. And great IT security strategies are underpinned by great networking. So if you, you, know, if you, if you find yourself in an interview situation, and it could be a part, a part of your new career aspirations, and somebody might ask you about security, you know, security of data, security of devices, security of users. What's your opinion about that? Now, we, we're not going to give you everything about security because it's an enormous field. It could be, your in, it could be a career on, on its own. It could be your career today. We're just going to start it today. We're going to make you cur curious about the topic. But if you were in that interview situation and somebody asked you about it, you, you need enough to be able to answer the question. So Isaac's going to introduce you to that, introduce you to it from a, a networking perspective and what you need to do as a network engineer to get a good security posture for a system. And then hopefully that, that knowledge will, will inspire you to go and search out more information uh, or just give you enough to, to answer that question in the interview. We're also going to cover today a kind of recap of the topics done so far. So we're going to start to recap on the courses as, as we've had it so far. Just start to give you some pointers as well of, of where you need to go if you're starting to prepare for the exam. So Isaac's going to get into that towards the second half of today. All right, that's it from me. It's done with the introduction. Now I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Isaac. So Claire, if you, want to, if you want to queue up Isaac and let's go for it and let's do part seven. Enjoy. Hi everyone. So nice to see everybody back here, see all the names scrolling through the list. Fantastic. Thank you for coming back week after week after week. We really are coming into land, right? Next week, final episode. Next week, we open up for the exam. Just want to say to those who, um, who have questions about the exam and stuff like that, um, just so you know, when we did the very beta class, the original beta class, um, very few people passed on the first time. Okay, so don't think that it's going to be just a walk in the park and it's going to be like dead easy and everybody's going to get it. No, there's a good chance you might not get it first time round, and you might have to do it a second time. But don't let that put you off, right? Don't let that put you off because I don't want to see any of you failing doing it two times and like quitting is like, oh, this is too difficult. No, do it first time. And if it doesn't, if you don't get it first time, okay, look at the review document, by the way. Um, there is a review document that Claire is going to make available towards the end of the session. It will appear in Meeting Pulse on that URL that you see appear over and over, uh, you know, during the, uh, during the teaching. So if you go to Meeting Pulse, go to that URL, there's a section called Materials, um, and that'll open up you know, maybe with 15 minutes to go before the end of the session. And in there, there will be a review document. And basically what it is, it's one page per lesson uh, per week that we did. 
and it will it's kind of in a tree format so it will show you the 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 stuff that we did and and from there you should be able to uh, if you fail first time go there go check the areas that you weren't quite comfortable in and maybe go do a little bit more research go watch the videos again or just you know go do a, a search you know uh, on the internet and learn a bit more about the sections but Come on, we want to see lots of you, lots and lots of you get your your uh, your certification, right? Uh, ne uh, Extreme Network uh, uh, Associate. So that would be really, really cool, and that to me would be, you know, the the the, the cherry on the top. Um, coming to you again from Cambridge, um, uh, wonderful city. After lockdown has ended, who knows when? Uh, if you're ever, you know, in Cambridge, or if you ever come through to Cambridge. Hey, just contact me on LinkedIn or whatever. Just tell me you're going to be in Cambridge and I'll try my best to meet up with you. Uh, you know, even if it's just for an hour or so, it's just fantastic to have a coffee, uh, you know, and walk around a little bit, uh, this, this fantastic little town, city. But um, here we go. So today we're going to do two sessions. Uh, the first session is going to be about security basic security and the second section is going to be a review of everything that we've done now you know we've done you know six seven weeks of of content six weeks that's 12 hours of content it's going to be difficult to review in 45 minutes i'm going to have to rush through everything but um it's worthwhile staying on it's worthwhile staying connected so that you can see exactly um you know what you think you should expect in the exam uh, and just for us to to just to to, to cover these uh, you know the 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 everything that we did in uh, in in very you know light detail so on to security um we had a debate, uh, the team, Rowan, you know, Paul, Claire, Dave, myself, we, we had a, um, a chat about this last week. And we were trying to figure out, you know, in what depth do we go to? Because Extreme Networks is not a security company. There are many of those, um, you know, around uh, that, that do security and do, you know, infinite different amounts of of security things so what level do we go to that was something that we were discussing how much do we put into this because security is such a big topic right it is such a big topic that where do you start and where do you end and how do you even do something like this in in 30 minutes it's 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 impossible. It's impossible to do. So we kind of came to the the idea that it would be better for us, for me to talk about security on a very high level, okay? Overview, to give you basics, to give you the types of things that that you should think about, start thinking about, rather than trying to dig in and go into massive detail. And so that's what I'm going to try and um, that's what I'm going to try and do today um, uh, in, in this session that we have. So let's look at this. Um, the idea over here is really um, to look. Oops, let me go back. I'm sorry about that. To, to learn the basics of um, network security. OK, so. Um, what are the goals of, of network security? Okay. Because we talk about network security. I'm going to be talking about network security here, but you understand that in a sense, it's about IT security because network security is not only access to your network, but even to your computer. If you're only ever as strong as your weakest point. And although people will say to you that, you know, it's really important to have firewalls and it's really important to have all these, these, these bits and pieces and hardware and all sorts of stuff, the truth is that you and I are probably the weakest link when it comes to security. Um, but if we could implement a, a, a 
good network policy, security policy, what would be the goals of something like that, right? What would be the goals? What would we be aiming for? What would we be trying to do? And the first would be to protect the the network from external attacks, okay? Oops, there I go again. To protect the network from external attacks. The second is to protect IT assets from unauthorized access. So IT access would mean your servers, your printers, your access points, assets, IT assets, your computers from unauthorized access. Now, of course, there are people in your office that have access, in your company that have access to, to the devices, you know, in the office. But it doesn't mean that just because I work for extreme that I'm allowed to go into the server room or that I'm allowed to go and mess with the configuration of a printer. So access doesn't just mean, oh, you're an employee, you have access, you're not an employee, you don't have access. It's a lot more granular than that. And I'm sure you guys understand that I don't have to, you know, to, to explain, you know, that in a lot of detail. And then a third goal would be to ensure that the right people get access to the right resources. So if your job is engineering, if you're a software engineer, then you obviously need access to the resources that you need to do your job properly. Okay? But you don't need access to HR. You don't need access to the HR databases, right? because you're a software engineer working on some code. Um, I might be, you know, a technical trainer. I have no reason to go and access HR. You know, materials got nothing to do with me. It's, it's, it's nothing to do at all with me. Or even to go look at software development, right? I should be able to get access into documentation because I need that to do my job. But there are certain areas that I have no need to be in. And so a network security policy needs to take these things into consideration, needs to make sure that the right people get access to the right resources, that assets, IT assets, computer, networking, uh, uh, server, all of those, those assets, I need to protect them from unauthorized access, both internally and externally, and also protect my network from external attacks. Now, what do we mean by external attacks? Well, we can look at it this way. I've listed here a number of, uh, a number of these, uh, these, these things. And some of you, or most of you, should be aware of most of these things, okay? Um, there was a time a few years ago where we constantly had uh, new viruses popping up all the time, okay? Uh, and this, you know, um, this was caused oftentimes by insecure uh, operating systems. We, we had a period of time where Windows was an incredibly vulnerable operating system. And so anybody with a little bit of knowledge could easily write a virus that could affect Microsoft Windows machines, okay? That was just the way that it was. And until Microsoft fixed that, we were incredibly vulnerable to viruses. And so we had the birth of the antivirus companies, right? And when, when I was starting in this, we had companies like Norton, right? Norton Antivirus, and that was a really popular and then it grew and there's a vast and and there's you know there's so many of these companies that write software uh, um, antivirus software but we kind of got to a point where operating systems started to get better and better and better Microsoft eventually started to understand that unless they they sorted this issue out it would constantly and permanently tarnish the name of the operating system, right? So they, they've included antivirus software within their own operating system. They, they were forced to do that simply because it was giving the software a bad uh, reputation. So viruses 
we kind of it's like the human virus right they they spread they infect from one to to the other um and you know we had viruses that had caused massive amount of destruction uh, the the effects of these things is they could affect your computer, infect your computer. They could delete files. They could do all sorts of stuff like that. And so some of them were quite innocuous and there were others that became really, really problematic. Nowadays, we would probably say that I don't want to, to, to tell you that they're not as virulent or they are not as dangerous as what they were before. No, because today they they just mean that if, if, if viruses are going to attack you, they are going to be even more malicious than what they were previously because the software has got so much better. So the vector to attack has meant that if they really want to attack you with a virus, then it's going to be somebody that's really smart and has got the resources to bypass all the safeguards that the operating system uh, uh, manufacturers have put into place. But the systems have got a lot better than what they were. And today we don't see as many viruses in the wild as what we did before and doing as much damage. But don't take that as, oh, I don't need to, you know, to update my antivirus. I don't need to buy antivirus. I am safe. Don't take that attitude. Buy an antivirus. Keep it up to date. If you've got Windows, make sure that it's up to date because it's a vector of attack, but it's not the only one. Spyware. Spyware, right? You've all at some point browsed to a website and you know, you've seen these pop-ups, uh, you know, before there used to be flash pop-ups, but you still see them nowadays. You're working on a site and a website will come up and will say, oh, we've done a scan on your machine or we've detected that your machine is vulnerable, you know, to, uh, to, to viruses. Please click here, you know, to do a check, you know, on your machine. And you're, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Let me click on that. Or you do something like, would you like to know your IP address? Click here. Okay, you click there. And you click here or you click there. And, you know, would you like a timer for your machine? Keep your time up to date, you know, you know, with, with an atomic clock. And it kind of sounds like a good idea. And you get involved in that. You click on it. And what happens? Without you even knowing, it goes and installs some software on your computer. It could be on your browser, within your browser. It could add a little button within your browser, right? And all of a sudden, it's like, gee, my computer's so slow. I don't know what happened. I downloaded this fantastic utility, keeps my clock up to date. But since then, my computer is so slow. Hmm, spyware. What spyware doing? What was the reason behind the spyware? Well, maybe they're spying on what you're doing, on your software. They could be they could be spying on, on what you're doing. You go to a website, they spy on that. Do you understand? So spyware is a threat. And how does it get to your machine? Most times through the internet, a network. Okay. Malware, the same type of thing. It pretends to be a piece of software to do this, but it might be doing something else apart from what it's supposed to do. Adware, you've seen all of this. I mean, I don't use Windows and I haven't used Windows for years. Uh, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Mac user and it doesn't mean that we are safe. You know, a, a lot of people think, oh, Mac is safe. Uh, you know, you'll, we'll never get malware or adware. That's not true. The probability is less because Mac is, is a, you know, inherently safer operating system. But don't Get yourself fooled thinking, oh, just because I use, you know, Mac, I'm, I'm completely safe. I'll never get this stuff. We get it. We see it. We, you know, it's it's there. Adware. All of a sudden, you just see ads. You go shopping for something and you just see ads all the time. Like, what on earth is going on? These are vectors of attack. And these are things that you will end up on your machine 
most times through the network. Of course, it could be somebody giving you a USB. Oh, I don't have a USB key here, but you know, giving you a piece of software on a USB key. Hey, you know, I downloaded this. This is great. Whatever. You don't have an antivirus or whatever it might be. You install this on your machine and you install some some adware, some malware, etc., etc. Most times, the vectors are the network. Ransomware, right? Ransomware. This is a big one. I, I have a friend uh, in South Africa who, you know, he does work. Um, you know, he is a contractor and he does work for IT company. And um, one of the companies that he does work for, they were um, they were um, um, locked out of the data by ransomware, and they demanded X amount of money to unlock the data. Um, they had a database with a lot of inf information, a lot of important information, and they didn't have proper backups in place. They hadn't updated all their backup software, and they thought, not a problem. We'll just go and restore from a backup. Well, guess what? Their backup didn't work. Their restore didn't work, and they were stuck, and they lost huge amounts of data. So this could be your business, right? And if this affects your business, you could literally lose your entire business. Think about this if you were a school, if you're managing IT for a school, or you're managing IT for a, you know, a, for, a, for a doctor's room or for a hospital. And imagine that you are attacked with ransomware and they ask for, for money, you know, a ton of money to unlock the data. Imagine the legal implications for you if your data gets stolen and you can't get it back. It could destroy your business. So when we talk about security, we, we, it's more than just a virus or a nuisance. This can be really, really serious. Trojan horse, right? A Trojan horse. Something planted inside your network that you know, gives a opening for somebody from the outside to get in and steal passwords and steal data. Now, Trojan horse often would be somebody that would do that maliciously, but it's still a vector of attack from within your network. What other threats are there? Well, DDoS, DDoS. For those of you who don't know, for those of you who are you know, just starting in this particular thing or, or looking at IT as a career, it's called a distributed denial of service. It's when an attacker, somebody with bad intentions, might use spyware, ransomware, a malware to install a little bit of software on hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of computers around the world. It doesn't have to be from within your network. It could be from outside. And what they do is all of those machines will, will form a coordinated attack against your server. So imagine you have a server. Imagine you selling stuff online, right? Because your business had to move online. And now, you know, you've done your business online. Everything is fantastic. And now you get a distributed denial of service attack, which means that instead of you, you know, being set up to to receive, say, 5,000 hits per second, you suddenly hit with a million hits per second. And your computer just can't handle this, right? It can't handle it. It falls over. And that becomes a vector of attack for somebody malicious to either deny your website being up and running, right? Getting traffic and generating sales. Or alternatively, to allow people, an attacker, to get into root, to get into the very heart of your operating system and, and do an attack that way. Now, I'm explaining it very basically, okay? But I just want to give you, you know, a curiosity so that if you don't know, if you've never heard of DDoS, you can go and type it into a search engine, go and look it up and see, whoa, okay, now I, I see what this could be okay so do go do the research but this is ways that these this little adware this malware on all computer could be coordinated to a 
attack a particular website that might be very strong, very resilient. You hit it with a denial of service attack and it could be a vector for somebody to attack. Threats could be new threats, right? Every day, as smart as networking companies are, as security companies are, as smart as they are and as smart as, as software they write and, and better protections that they offer, as long as there's a financial reward, there will always be people determined to break through those safety chains, to break through those safety barriers, to hack systems. As long as there's financial reward, somebody smart is always going to be attacking. So today we look at these viruses, spyware, malware. That's what we understand as the threat today. But what is the threat tomorrow? Okay. What about AI, artificial intelligence? What about, you know, machine learning? What about those things? What about things that we haven't even imagined that are going to become vectors of attack? What about people um, who uh, manipulate video and make it seem as if it's somebody, uh, you're getting an instruction from somebody that you know, and meanwhile, that video has been tampered with, and the voice has been changed, and you could be getting an instruction to do something, but it's not actually the person you think it is. These are vectors of attack that are, are, are going to evolve with time. And these are things that we need to be completely aware of. What about you and me, right? It's often said that the weakest link is the human in a security chain. And, and the, I, I, I totally believe it's true. You can have strong firewalls, strong policies. You can have all of these things. But if the financial reward is there for somebody to steal data, for somebody to do things that they shouldn't do, it's going to happen. And unless you have specific policy and unless you've restricted somebody to have, you know, specific access to only the things that they need, you open your scope, you open the area of attack. That's why as we'll go on, we'll see how policy helps you to define that and to close that down, to close that gap down. But you and me, we often get, we see these messages, right? That irritating message saying, your machine has downloaded a security update, please update it. And it always seems to come at the worst, the very worst time for us. Like, oh, I'm doing a present, I can't update now. I'll do it later, I'll do it later, I'll do it later. And then it's too late. So we need to be on the game. We need, you and I, we need to be aware of what is happening. We need to be aware when an update appears, it's inconvenient. I know, but don't forget to do it just because it's inconvenient. We have to do these updates. We have to keep our mach machines up to date, our software up to date. Otherwise, we open ourselves up for vectors. What about social engineering? Kevin Mitnick, one of the most famous hackers ever, he wasn't a particularly brilliant hacker. I don't know. This is what I read. You know, people say he wasn't particularly brilliant at actually hacking, but he was very good at social engineering, you know, and I still think that social engineering is the weakest link because it, it's, it implies people, right? If you get somebody knocking on your door saying, so I'm from the telco company, uh, I'm from BT, whatever, we've had a lot of complaints that the internet access has been really slow in this area. Can I just check your network? Can I just check the, the, the routers over here? Most people will say, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. I mean, network really sucks, right? I paid for 100 megs. I'm only getting 60. Exactly. So exact. Those are the complaints that we're getting. Um, and, and it's not just you. It's all the neighbors. They've all said the same thing. So um, I've I wanted to start here and then go to everybody and make sure that, you know, that the firmware is updated, etc., etc. Most people will say, yeah, sure, no problem. You know, absolutely go and upgrade it. That's the vector. That's the vector. So these are the threats. 
that we need to mitigate against. And it becomes so much more difficult when somebody says, I know nothing about computers. All I know how to do is just FaceTime and send a few things and I just use the iPad you know, to, to browse the internet, that's all. When we don't know, we are vulnerable. So it's important for us to talk about security. It's important for us to consider security. It's important for me to raise this so that you can consider and think about these things. Think about this information and go and read about it. Go and read about these things. There's plenty of information. Don't just read one source. Read various sources so that you get a balanced view of how you should think about threats. Okay. All of these or many of these were spyware, malware, adware, ransomware. All of them had, or many of them had, where. You know, what you need to do is you need to be aware. Aware. That's what we need to do. That's our job when we're looking at security. We have to be aware. You, as somebody who's watching this, as somebody who's interested in a career in, in networking, you have to be aware. It starts with you. So how do we go about, if, if we are network engineers, if we want to get into networking, if we want to run networks for our, for our customers, if you're a contractor, for example, what are the types of things, how do you go about you know, securing a network? Well, one of the first things is to put together a security policy. Now, I'm pretty sure that none of you who work for large companies, and there might be many of you working for large companies, I'm pretty sure that every large company has security policies, a, a policy that you get told about when you join the company, for example, and they will give you, and they will say, these are the policies, the security policies. And most people go through, yes, yes, go, you know, get, do a test, yes, 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 cool, and, I, and I've done all of this, right? But there might be people that are watching this. Maybe even you do work for a large company. Then if I were to say to you, what is your security policy? You would either say to me, sure, it's been so long, I don't actually know. I don't know. There might be other people that would say, we don't have a security policy. We don't, we're just like, we don't, we don't have it. We're a small company. There's only five people in the company, 10 people in the company. We don't have a security policy. Maybe it's just me and my wife. We run a business. We don't have a security policy. That's a bad mistake. Security policy is where you start. That's the document. It's actually a document that you need to put together. Or if there is one, you need to go and read. Okay, you need to go and read that. See what is the security policy. And if you don't have one, see how you go about creating a security policy. Because a security policy is a document that talks about rules and procedures. And it says things like, you are now not allowed to use your company phone if it doesn't have a secure certificate from Extreme Networks on it. You're not allowed to use it for company resources. Or it will say something like, if you want to use your own phone to access company email, then that phone will have a, a secure password. In other words, your four-digit password for your iPhone or your Android phone, sorry, you can't do that. It has to be six digits or eight digits, right? That could be a policy that you, that you have. You might have a policy that says, if your phone, your personal phone, which has got company email on it, if your personal phone gets stolen, then we have the right as the company to send a kill command to that phone to wipe out that phone so that nobody can get access to our resources. You might think that's a bit harsh, but if it's the company data on there, hopefully you're backing up to the cloud every night and if they steal it, you've got all your data, right? But if the company needs to do that, you need to put that into the policy. Now, if you're a small company, that might not apply to you. You might not have those types of resources to do those things. 
but a, a security policy provides clarity and it says this is how we operate right these are the rules this is what you can do this is what you can't do and if those things are clear if those things are unambiguous then you've already gone a massive step okay to implement a secure mentality within your company security policy also needs to be communicated often it's no good just telling people about security when they join the company so what three years in no one has ever told you anything more about security do you think that in three years the security threat hasn't changed so if you are in networking if you want to be a good networking engineer if you're responsible for a networking Communicating the policy, communicating your security policy is important. Out of sight, out of mind. If you don't remind people about the security policy, people forget. So it's not just important to have a security policy. It's important to communicate it and to talk about it and to test it. Often at extreme, every now and then we get an email. And sometimes those emails are, I mean, you know, you look at them and it's like, whoa. The other day I got one that said something like, we wanted, um, we couldn't deliver an Amazon parcel, uh, you know, to, to, to your house. Um, please click on here to reschedule a time. And I'm like, I'm sure that when I bought stuff from Amazon, I didn't use my company account. But maybe they said they were going to send me this mug right the company said they were going to send me this mug so yeah maybe amazon tried you know you know when that that thing goes off in your head and it's like mm, there's something fishy over here when you see something fishy it's probably fishy so i saw that email as like yeah no i didn't order anything and I, I just went in and we have a procedure at Extreme to report phishing emails. P-H-I-S-I-N-G. It's like mm, they were trying to fish something from me. And I, I reported that, you know, and within a few seconds it came back and it said, well done. You, you have, um, th that was a test to see, you know, um, you know, if you were going to click on that and stuff like that. So test often. If you have a policy, test it to see right and not only then test it measure it if it audited if you don't measure something how will you know if it's efficient or not if you have a security policy with rules and regulations in place with you know it says you can do this you can't do that these are the procedures when this happens when that happens if you've got a phishing email click on this button to report it if you don't have those things and if or if you have them but you don't measure them how will you know? So you can do these tests yourself or you have third party companies that will do something. I think we have a third party company that does it for, for, for extreme. If you send out a thousand emails and 500 people click on that link, you know, because they missed a delivery, that's 50% vulnerability threat that you have. Now, that's a baseline, right? When we started it, this is what we did, 50%. When you do it in two months or three months' time, if 60% of them click on it, it's like, ooh, you have a real problem. You need to do some more training. If 30% of them click on it, then your program has been successful because you've reduced the vector of attack. You've reduced that. So you do it again. You know, to those people who clicked on it, you send them an additional email. Please go and do some training. Da, da, da. You know, we sent out a test. You clicked on this. That, that could have meant an opening. Do you understand? So it's really important that not only you have a policy, that you communicate it often, that you test it, but that you measure it so that you can see. And obviously, if you find people in the company that every single time are getting caught hook, line and sinker, that is a real threat that you have in your business. And you need to do something about that. You know, have a special class, uh, have special training, you know, talk to their manager, do something so that you help them to not become the vector by which your company is attacked. 
What about enforcing, right? Learn to live within the rules without exceptions. One of, when, when I was an IT manager uh, running my own business, it was very difficult for me oftentimes to enforce rules because management would say, ah, yeah, we want it to be, we want rules for all the staff, but not for me, you know? So that becomes a real problem. And I'm paying you, so you do what I tell you to do. But like anything else, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So when you implement policy, always try and get the implementation to be okayed from the top down, right? Not from the bottom up. Because if management is on board, if management is not clicking on those links, if management is pushing out policy, don't do that, why are you accessing that, why are you asking for that? If management is taking security seriously, then automatically the people below them will also take security seriously. But if it's one rule for staff and one rule for me, then you have exceptions. And when you have exceptions, the weakest link is always where the chain is going to break. So learn to live within the rules and without exceptions when it comes to security. And everybody will be safer. So what's the starting point? Okay, if you're a smaller company, if you're a little, you know, consulting business or whatever, where do you start? How to do this? If you're in networking right now, you might be responsible for running three or four switches in the company. It could be all of those things or none of those things. But how, what are the practical things that, that you could do? Well, let's look at some, some of these. And some of these, listen, if you're, into net, if you're into network security, if you're a security guy with all these big qualifications behind your name, this is not going to be revelation to you. But maybe you can see some of these and say, yeah, I need to, I need to implement that. I've got, I've got lazy on these things. So let's look at some of these. Regular password changes. We don't like change as humans. And that's a vector that, uh, that, that, um, that hackers know. They know we don't like change. So we get lazy with passwords. Now, at, at extreme, we get forced, um, you know, every, every, um, every few weeks, well, not few weeks, a little bit more than a, than a few weeks, to change our passwords. We get notifications, go in and change your password. That is good policy. But how many of you on your personal accounts change your passwords? Probably you have the same password for the last 10 years, right? Just think about it. When last did you change your password on Gmail? Isaac, when last did you change your password on Gmail? Oops. <laughs> right? If somebody has your password, they could have been reading your email for the last five years and you wouldn't even know. But that's something within your grasp. You can go and do it, right? So regular password changes. If you're running a network, small or large, if it's for five users or 10 users or 500 users, make it a regular thing to change passwords. Very important. Password complexity. We hate passwords. We hate changing passwords. When they say to us, oh, it's got to have eight letters and one uppercase and one lowercase and one this and one character, it's like, oh, I hate this, right? You, if you're doing, if you're enforcing these things, you can help your people to create great passwords. You know, people come up with passwords, their dog's name, their name, second name, uppercase, lowercase, all of these things. But it's so much more efficient if you think of a sentence, if you think of a saying, and just think about, you know, something like, I'm going to take something really silly. Please don't use this as a password. But think about something like, Mary had a little lamb, a, a regular children's rhyme. Mary had a little lamb. What about creating a password with the first five letters of those, of, of those words? Mary had M-H-A-L-L, -L, right? There's no English word like that, right? It's difficult. And then on top of that, Add maybe a question mark, add an exclamation mark, 
and then put a number, you know, whatever number, to take the last two digits of your passport number or, 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 or of your uh, credit card number or something like that, or the first two digits or whatever it might be, something that you remember, the first two digits of your telephone number. It's something that you can remember and it's really complex, okay? It's really complex. Rather than thinking of the word, uh, you know, Nando's, capital N, capital S. What are the chances? That's an English word. It's easy to guess that. Do you see? So think of a structure. Think of a phrase, you know, to be or not to be. That is the question. Ten letters. Wow. I could add an uppercase and a lowercase beginning in the end. I could add an exclamation mark. I could add the at sign. Do you understand? So complexity, use complexity in your in your in your passwords. Even for your own passwords, for your Twitter account, for your Instagram account, use those things, okay? Because they will help you. Um, what about restricted? Uh, oh, no default passwords. So many times people get devices like a switch, like a router, like an access point, like that router that your your your. My apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. <laughs> um, don't leave default passwords on devices. If you get that black box from your from your telecom, from your internet provider, from your ISV, don't leave the default password on there. Change it. For all your devices, don't leave default passwords there. You're just opening up a vector of attack for people to be able to attack, if that's what they want to do, right? Don't ever think that because you're not a crook, because you're not a thief, everybody around you is the same way. You just don't know. Restricted access to infrastructure, right? If you're working in a company and you have a server room, don't allow anybody to go into that server room. Don't do that. Put a lock on it. Put a code on it. If necessary, put a camera on the inside so when anybody opens the door, you have a camera that records and sends that information to a cloud somewhere so that you can, if anything ever happens, you've got a face that you, that you can check, right? Put an access card, something to that effect so that you, you close the vectors down. These are practical things that, that you can do. Restricted um, devices, okay? There are devices that you don't want anybody to have access to. If you have an, an exchange server that, ma that handles all the email, you don't want anybody getting access to that. So restrict that device. Restrict. If it's in a cabinet, lock the cabinet, right? Make sure the password for that is not the same as for all of those things. Restrict the devices that people can get access to. What about training on social engineering awareness? This is something that, that you can do, that especially if you're a large company. Um, teach people about how how social engineering happens how how people try the vectors that people try you know just teach people that a network engineer an item is never going to ask for your network password they're never going to phone you and say hey give me your password please i want to test something just teach people that's never going to happen so when somebody does do a test about like, no, dude, I'm not going to give you my password over them. It's not going to happen. Not by your bank, not by your ISP, not internally. Don't give them. I, I've, I've done when I was a contractor. I can tell you, I remember, OK, needing to access someone's computer and saying to them, hey, dude, I need the password for your computer. And they would say to me, you know, just like that they would say oh it's 07443 <laughs> it's like <laughs> and they was like no but everybody we all work here so everybody's okay it's not okay don't do those types of things what about starting at home okay these things start at home thinking about security starts even from your home teach your kids you know if you have kids Teach them from a young age to have passwords. Um, at school, they teach kids, you know, put the passwords, but 
they don't really teach them. Just make it four letters. One, two, three, four. That's not a password. Teach your kids. Sit with your kids. Teach them from a young age to be security aware, right, with their passwords. So that as they grow up, it's not something that they need to even think about because they've been taught since a young age that they need to be aware. They need to be aware of social engineering. They need to be aware of people. So oh, give me your password. No, you don't give people passwords. No, you don't. You don't. Correct? So it starts at home. Um, what about people who have the same password for every website, right? You go to Google, Gmail, you use the same password that you use for Instagram, that you use for Facebook, that you use for, for your company, for your corporate office, that you use for... Hey, if your password gets hacked on the one side, believe me, hackers are going to try that same password on your bank account, on every other account. If you have the same, it's going to hurt you. Now, I told you about a procedure that you could use to create, you know, by having, you know, uh, to be or not to be the first letter or the last letter of everything like that. If you want to differentiate at the end of that password, if it's for Instagram, add IG, right? If it's for Facebook, add FB. If it's for, you know, HSBC, add HS, something to that effect. That way, you know, oh, the password is the same, but I change it for every specific website. Put it at the front, put it at the back, put it in the middle, you know. Think about these things, but don't have one password for all of your websites. Be security conscious. Change your Wi-Fi password at home. Do it today. If you've never changed your password, your Wi-Fi password at home, do it today. Log into that router or, you know, using your browser, go and change it today. Now, understand that um, if you've got like an Apple TV and you've got other devices, you will need to change it on those devices as well. And you might think, that's too much work. Don't think like that. Become security aware. Change that Wi-Fi password today. And put a, put a proper password on your computer, your router, your access point. Put proper passwords on those things. And you will see that as you develop this sense of security awareness, that it will permulate, permu, perm, permeate through, um, through, through all of the things you do from your home, to your car, to your work, to your banking accounts, to all of those things, to your devices when you set up a switch, when you set up a router. Think security in everything you do. Let me just um, cut away to a video that we have where you can see what Extreme Networks does uh, when it comes to security. and and. Even though we're not a security company per se, that doesn't mean that our technology doesn't contain security. And, and the way that we think about this doesn't have very secure elements in it. Have a look. From smart sensors to advanced robotics, facial recognition, augmented and virtual reality, technology and IoT are having a profound effect on your business. But is your network keeping up? Built node-by-node, application-by-application, protocol layered on top of protocol. It's the way it's always been done, but it's not working anymore. That's why we created Extreme Fabric Connect, a new simplified way to design, build, and manage networks. Based on enhanced shortest path bridging, Fabric Connect is the industry's most efficient networking technology, advancing networks by making them more flexible, automated, and secure. Rather than layering protocols, Fabric Connect simplifies the network by using a single advanced control plane for all of your routing, switching, multicast, and segmented traffic. With just one protocol, the network is simpler to design, operate, and troubleshoot. Recoveries are sub-second, so users don't even notice. Forget about the days of color-coded ports, manual configuration, and off-hours maintenance windows. Instead, services become elastic. Extending and retracting on demand as devices connect and disconnect from the network. Strengthen your security posture by saying goodbye to flat IP networks. 
Deploy fully isolated network segments with ease and at scale to protect your critical information from the threat of an attack. For whatever innovative technology your business demands, you need a network that can support it. Join the thousands of Extreme Fabric Connect customers that have enhanced their users' experience. Amazing things are possible with the right combination of elements. To learn more about Extreme Fabric Connect, visit us at www.extremenetworks.com. Wow, pretty cool, eh? You could be one of those engineers doing that type of uh, stuff, you know, with with fabric. Absolutely fantastic. So yeah, even though we're not a you know a focused security company. That doesn't mean that we don't have some incredible security technology that gets wrapped around uh, the uh, networking and provides fantastic uh, abilities to segment and do and do wonderful security things. Hey, uh, before we go to the break, two things I want you to ask. Uh, number one is um, please let us. Um, you know, last week we did some photos, you know, and we, we, we asked you, we opened up and we said, hey, send, a, send us a photo. It could be a selfie. It could be out your window if there's snow on the ground or if you have a nice view, just, you know, take a photo out, you know, out, out your window. Maybe you want to take a photo of, uh, of your, your setup. You know, do you have one screen, two, three screens? Um, maybe you're in a server room or you have a server room close to you, got a server room. Hey, just take a photo and send it to us. We'd like to have like, one photo with just dozens or hundreds you know of of uh, of little photos from everybody who watched that would be wonderful like a class photo that would be great if you can contribute so that's the one thing meeting pulse there's a section in meeting pulse called photo that's where we uh, we want you to go the other thing that i want to ask you to do and and i hope you guys do on the chat on the little chat window just tell us where you are a uh, city or town and country Okay, we want to see who is the furthest north, furthest south, furthest east and furthest west from from Cambridge. Let's say from Cambridge. Right. So go for it. Just tell us where you are. And uh, so that we know where you guys are in the in uh, in the world. Cool. See you after the break. Send us that picture. Send us. Tell us where you are in the world and we'll see you in about 10 minutes time. Cheers. My name is uh, Chris Friends. I'm the AVP of Information Security for Interfaith Medical Center. And in terms of networking and security, we're widely known for being one of the first hospitals in the country to go zero trust. Uh, we're six sites, roughly 2,500 users. At the time, we had an older network. Um, it was the old Nortel switches. They were due for replacement. And we had evaluated a lot of vendors, and Extreme offered the best feature to price ratio for us. In terms of solutions, products, and services, we use um, extreme switches for our edge, we have extreme switches in our core and our data center. We also make use of the extreme NAC and the extreme IDS, as well as the extreme management console. My favorite solution from Extreme is the NAC because it really has helped us achieve our zero trust strategy. A zero trust is basically the concept where you restrict all network communications to only communications that are essential for whatever particular device to function. If you just look at the news lately, you can see that there has been constant ransomware attacks against hospitals. One of the big ones was actually WannaCry last year. And one of the interesting things about WannaCry is it didn't only affect the PCs within hospitals, but within a lot of hospitals, the medical devices themselves actually became um, encrypted. And this is a huge patient safety issue and as far as I'm concerned it results in a whole new and wholly unacceptable meaning for the term denial of service. And it's obviously one of the things that we were very concerned with because protecting our patients is one of our top priorities. Flat Networks allows attackers to laterally move through the organization and basically take a single compromise point within the organization and begin to spread it to more and more systems and that's the kind of thing that we wanted to avoid. So we use the NAC to achieve a zero trust strategy where we heavily segment our network. In terms of the decision to go zero trust, I'm actually very big on testing security. 
So I had written a script that basically took a list of all the PC names within the organization, executed the script on a PC, and what the script would do is it would try to copy and execute that ICAR test string on each PC within the organization. And one of the things we found when we did this test is that the network segmentation we had in place at the time was actually very effective at mitigating the spread of this outbreak. We really wanted to build on that because it was so effective and increase the level of segmentation we had. So that's when we kind of began to introduce things like the network access control appliance, which allowed us to put policies in to even protect devices within the same VLAN or even on the same switch from each other. We have much less latency now than we had with some of the, the past switches we had. We've had a very good relationship with Extreme. I've, we've had no issues with the support. It's always been very helpful. My favorite part working with Extreme was basically how they helped us implement the, the zero trust within our environment, how they came down and actually worked with us to achieve the goal that we had in mind. Extreme Academy was created with one purpose in mind, to help educate and inspire the next generation of technologists and prepare them for the workplace. Through Extreme Academy, we are bringing our state-of-the-art training resources to innovative universities, colleges, and training centers all over the world. The Academy offers a hands-on practical curriculum that gives students a foundation in the basis of networking, as well as advancements in artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud, and automation. With this knowledge, they will have real-world skills and a true competitive advantage when they are ready to join the workforce, creating a much-needed talent stream for the industry at large, ready to take on the jobs of tomorrow. No previous networking experience is necessary to be part of Extreme Academy. All you need is a love of technology and a desire to learn. Students that complete Extreme Academy courses will be rewarded with an Extreme Networks Associate Level Certification. This will help connect these students to their future jobs and help them stand out as they launch into their new careers. The Academy courses complement existing curriculums and they are there to be taken advantage of by teachers. 
Courses can be integrated with existing lesson plans or be taught separately as standalone courses. Extreme Networks is an ideal training partner. As a leading provider of cloud-driven networking solutions, our technology provides the secure, reliable connectivity we depend on every day. And our schools and our hospitals and retail stores, manufacturing floors, restaurants, hotels, sporting events, you name it. And with a fast shift to remote working and distance learning, our cloud-driven networking solutions are essential to ensuring business continuity in increasingly distributed environments, helping our 50,000 customers and 9,000 partners around the world to continue to advance how we live, work, and share. Extreme is continuously developing curriculum to keep up with the pace of our rapidly changing industry, and we're excited to bring our experience and expertise to all of you who are tasked with defining the future of work and what our increasingly connected world looks like. Getting involved is easy. All you need to do is register your interest on our website and reach out. Investing in knowledge is investing in yourself. Be part of Extreme Academy and get started today. Welcome back. So before I go on, I need to apologize for something. <clears throat> Last week, um, I gave you some homework. And uh, or the week before, which was with Dijkstra's uh, algorithm. And I sent you some homework. And last week, I gave you the results of the homework. And very quickly, people started uh, coming back with questions and saying, hey, um, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't correct. You gave us the incorrect answer. And I went and looked and I was, oh, I am so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. I don't know what happened. I think I had a brain freeze. And I just, I, I don't know how I did the working out, but I got it incorrect. So please let me apologize. I'm really sorry for, for making that mistake, for letting that slip through. Um, I have subsequently fixed it. I still do expect you to go and watch the uh, the homework from, uh, I think it was week five. There was an exercise to go watch a YouTube video on, um, on Dijkstra's algorithm. It's very important that that you watch that and then do and then do the homework and then go and check the workings out uh, of that uh, of that that homework. In terms of this week, well, um, as you know, we're going to do a review now. Um, I'm really nervous about doing this review because I've got, you know, 45 minutes, maybe, you know, maybe slightly less than that to review what we covered in six, six weeks less than that's two hours, that's 12 hours or, you know, whatever it was. Um, and it's going to be really difficult uh, to do. I'm, I'm nervous because I'm going to have to skip over so much, so much stuff. But I know that there's been, you know, a lot of you that have watched this content live, uh, you know, easily 250, 300 of you that have watched, you know, every every episode live. And I, I'm really 
grateful for that. Thank you so much for giving me, uh, you know, two hours of your time. And again, thank you for all those people who've been on the chat, who've been answering questions. It's it's really it's really fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, um, uh, so, you know, you you guys have helped. You've 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 answered questions when people have asked them, and that's why I'm feeling you know nervous because I'm gonna miss something. Uh, you know, if you if you were to say to me, Isaac, what you're going to do in terms of the exam, the other exam questions? Well, it's a bank. Uh, you know, of um, we create a bank of questions, and from that, there's uh, some questions that get asked on a randomized basis. So everyone who writes the exam is going to get slightly different, different, uh, different questions. Um, um, so let's, let's get, let's get to it. Let me try and, and cover some, some things the best that I can, um, without any further, uh, without any further ado. So let's get into it. Okay. So, Let's look at quickly the things that we started in lesson lesson one. We defined uh, the three important components that we said were core. We said that without a net, without these three things, you really don't have a network, right? I mean, you just you just don't have. Uh, oops, Ooh, what did I do there? Oh my goodness! Uh, so, oh my. There we go. Without these three things, we just don't have a network. They are a group of computers, uh, servers, or other devices that exchange information, a common language, right? Just like English now, we're talking about TCP, the common language that all computers around the world, all networking devices have got to speak. And then an infrastructure, you know, physically connected devices, your switch, your router, your access point, those things that pass the data, uh, that pass data between them. We spoke briefly about the principles, uh, you know, of approaching networking, you know, principles of smart approaches. And we said, well, it would require security. Security is something, the module that we've just done. Security is something that you've got to think about. How do we protect the the resources? How do we protect our information? Um, those things, the way we protect passwords and think about these things, that's obviously important. Redundancy, you know, a smart network, not only has it got to be secure but it's got it you got to have redundancy you can't work with a single point of failure and the bigger the business the more important the more transactions that you're doing on a web server etc the more important this redundancy becomes but not only that you know flexibility it's got to be every network that we create has got to be flexible right it's it's very important because you're always going to have growth you, you you're going to go growth if you just think about under COVID, how more and more of your employees are now working from remote locations and that's become the norm right you suddenly have to have vpn tunnels so every network that you design you always got to think that it's got to be flexible it's got to allow for growth um you know um, be it locally regionally or internationally Cost. We said that smart networks always, someone who designs a smart network always has to think about cost. Um, you know, the cost. Just because your network grows doesn't mean you need to hire another 20 people or another 25 people to run the network. We saw last week when we looked at XIQ how you can, from a single pane of glass, run a network with 20 devices or 20,000 devices, right? So just because your network grows doesn't mean that the cost of maintaining that network has to grow proportionally. You've got to be smart about you design that. And, and obviously that then ties in with manageability. Um, you don't need to have rocket scientists to manage a network just to run your day to day. You don't need to do that. And manageability of networking is very, very important. So the next thing that we, the next module that we looked at was about data communication. And in that, we started to look at protocols. We started to define what protocols are, you know, a, a mechanism. And one of the examples that we, that we spoke about and, and that one of my colleagues, GT Heal, spoke about, really great. You can go and look at it on the uh, Extreme Net 
extreme networks youtube site so if you go to youtube and you just type in there as a search extreme networks you'll see um a, you know a whole lot of things including the academy section um or, or the live event section that's where all my stuff is but there's other stuff there uh that gt hill has as has created and Alyssa munn and some of the other engineers as well so it's a really good resource. In, in fact, I don't know why we don't have, you know, uh, the subscription there in the thousands. We, you know, if you haven't subscribed yet to Network, we're not putting stuff up there. You don't get notifications every two seconds. But if you haven't signed up yet for uh, for Extreme Academy notification for Extreme Networks notifications, go and do that because there's some great educational content there. Um, there's another one with XIQ. If you want to learn about XIQ, there's one of my uh, colleague called Marco Tisla, and he created this whole series of videos about XIQ. Fantastic! Go and watch it. Very, 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 very good. So go sign up for that. But um, but protocols, you know, the protocols, um, learn ab learning about these protocols, how you structure, you know. Uh, and so GT Hill talked about in the protocols, he talked about meeting the queen. If you were to meet the queen, there would be certain protocols. There would be a certain mannerism that you would approach. You would curtsy or bow slightly. You know, there would be a different way of talking to her as opposed to talking to anybody else. Protocols, very, very important in the world of computers. They allow devices to talk to each other. It doesn't matter in which country, in which network, as long as they 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 talk that common language, TCP IP, and then they talk the protocols, they can communicate between them, even if it's from different vendors, etc., etc. So that was really important. Then we started to look at addressing. We started to talk about computers and how when computers want to communicate with each other, they 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 kind of follow in the same type of of communication that humans do right humans want to talk to each other i want to talk to 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 my brother i phone him he has a phone number um, um that could be translated in in this course as an ip address if i have his ip address i can send him a message but if i have his phone number i can call him and i can hear his voice i can communicate um you know with him and i know we have apps that you can just you know call and they do voip voice over ip but you get the idea for these things to happen we need to have um, uh, addresses okay addresses just like in the old days when i sent a letter i had to have an I an address and that address had to be addressed to a person it had to have a street address a house number a city a country those things that's how we would send dates so we started to define that and and in there we then started to talk about the osi uh model and attempt at explaining uh, a conceptual attempt at explaining how when we send data from one computer to the next it goes through these different layers right these different layers starting up at the top of, with the application layer and then you know presentation and the session layer where certain things are done where there's encryption done and packaging is done and and uh, and, and that type of stuff right and then it keeps going down where you go into the transport layer is it udb is it is a tcp and then networking layer and then data link layer and then the physical layer and so we, we began to understand that when you press that send button, that in the background, there's a whole lot of magic happening with that packet, with that little bit of data. It needs an addressing. It needs a destination. It needs to know where it's going to go. And each one of these layers, as you work through these layers, has different protocols associated with that. So on layer seven, the application layer, there is where layers things like uh, protocols such as HTTP and FTP and DNS, um, etc. So layers, layers in themselves, um, um, uh, you know, the, the protocols operate within these specific, uh, within these specific layers. So that's important to, um, to, uh, to understand. And then the data, <clears throat> as the data moves from layer to layer, it's encapsulated. So we, we, we showed that here as, um, 
excuse me, we show that here as like a, a little pull. So as the data from the top layers is encapsulated and goes down, it's encapsulated, goes down, it gets added to the data already there. And then you can see on the next one, so we've got some more data and we encapsulate that. So the frame builds and builds and builds until it's ready to go out on the physical layer. We learned a little bit about this stuff and... Um, and this is this is important. These are the bodies. You might see this type of stuff that I'm covering today in the exam. It doesn't mean that if I don't cover it here, it won't be in the exam. But certainly I expect some questions around this uh, to pop up in the uh, the exam. Then we looked, we started to look at the individual layers. Uh, we tried, uh, instead of just going from seven to one, we kind of went to one and then we went to seven and then we went in between and we looked at the layers that way. But this was a very, very important one because this is where we started to learn about binary, which was the concept of zero and one on and off. And I kind of related it to uh, to a light switch in your room, right? When you turn on the light switch, that's like putting it to an on. Sometimes switches have a one and a zero. Perfect illustration. One, it's on. Uh, zero, it's off. And we started to understand about the, the base two numbering system, okay? And we said the reason for that is because we need to take uh, data and any type of data, like the word pizza, pizza, question mark, and we need to change that into a language the computer understands, which is binary, basically a system of zero and ones. Um, and, and once we've got that, we're all happy, right? Because the data can go across, the uh, data goes across the network. Um, we spoke about bits and bytes, and we spoke about how a bit can be a value of zero and one, but a byte is a combination, is actually eight bits made up together. In fact, last week, there was a there was a question that came up after the session had finished on meeting pulse, and I I forget um, who it was the the but it was a um, um, a lady that had asked um, a, a question and the question she had asked was she said in uh, in your homework on lesson lesson one or the first module you'd given us some homework and part of that was to convert a number, a long number, 11,000 and something into an IP address. And the comment was, well, the way I was taught at university um, uh, gave me a different answer to the answer that you gave. Could you please explain that? And I went like, Wow, that's really puzzling. And the person gave me a, a, a two sites. And she said, well, this site calculated it this way and, and this site calculated it your way. Which one of them is correct? And that really hurt my head, right? It's like, gee whiz, did I teach something wrong? And then I went to go and look at uh, uh, at what uh, the site <clears throat> that uh, that you had pointed out or that she had pointed out compared to the one that I did. And it was really easy. I was so relieved when I found the answer because it was quite simple. We said a byte is made up of eight bits, okay? And so um, uh, the answer that she had only had on the second byte it only had six characters listed because the first two or the first three bits were set to zero so in my answer i started with i think it was zero zero one and in her answer it just started with one in other words the 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 um, the answer was correct but technically, because a byte is eight bits long, the correct way, if you were doing an exercise, is to fill in zero, zero, not to leave it out, because you're indicating two bytes, and then you're indicating which one of those bytes is set to zero and set to one. So I did answer it on, on uh, Meeting Pulse, but that is the answer. Our answers were both correct. The difference was, I put in the leading zeros, and uh, the answer that that um, that she had done didn't have the the leading zeros. But ideally, you should always write it in this way with eight uh, with eight uh, with eight bits. 
So we looked at that. We uh, then got onto this where we started to do a really cool exercise about a binary. We discussed bit positions and least and most significant. And then we did a, a, an exercise where we went through and we created, we took a number and we worked out how that number would look in binary. And I got a lot of feedback on this. A lot of people were like, wow, I, I now know how to do binary. And that was fantastic. This was really good for people, for a lot of people. But ultimately, ultimately, this was the slide that pulled everything together. Because people kind of say, well, I know how, you know, I now understand binary, but I don't understand why. Why do we need, why does a computer need to do that? And this was the slide. If, if only one slide you remember from this whole course, I want it to be this one. Because this is where you take the zeros and ones that are these concepts, zero on and off, on and off. And when you change it into an electrical signal, right? When it's an electrical signal, a positive and a negative, that's when we can put it down a wire and send it down a wire and it can be translated on the other side. So this was the key slide and the really important slide. We spoke about simplex communication, about half duplex, right? We spoke about full duplex communication, how networks talk about today. We then defined some networks. We spoke about LAN, a local area network. We spoke about wireless LAN, WLAN, which is the same thing except using wireless devices. We kind of spoke about... Uh, campus lands, right? Campus lands, two or more neighboring building, often on the same kind of land, same type of premises. We then spoke about metropolitan area networks, you know, in different, in the same city, but in different locations completely. We kind of covered that. We looked then at um, wide area networks, continental in different continents. So we kind of discussed, uh, we kind of discussed these things. And then we spoke about virtual private networks, like a lot of ways that you guys are working at the moment using a virtual private network, either a software one or a hardware. We then when we were looking at, uh, at at layer one, the other thing we spoke about is how um, how networks uh, are um, uh, um, carry a sense multiple access, meaning that they what happens is they are open to collisions, especially pre switches, um, and and certainly we know about wireless where you get a lot of these uh, collisions. But we we understood we began to understand how networks within a segment how you can have collisions and so devices need to listen and then put content when there's free time slot you know s you know slip into that time slot and send data and if there's collision how both the devices or all the devices that sent at the same time need to stand step back for a random uh, uh, time slice and then retransmit we then looked a little bit at networks and and terminology we spoke about you know access layer the edge we called it the edge access layer the layer closest to the consumer so you know in your home the access layer would be your wireless access point right that's the layer closest to you but we saw on how in a in a bigger company you have this access layer and then behind that you have an aggregation layer right so all the access points they might connect into the switch you know or a number of switches on the on the aggregation layer and in a really big company, then you would have a core layer, um, you know, the very, very high end core that's then connected out onto their network. So we kind of spoke about these these different layers and the different types of connections and connection speeds that that you would have across all of those. We spoke a little bit about topology, about star topology, ring mesh. I would suggest that you go and do some research on these three, understand a little bit more about these three. You might see these as well in the exam. They make a perfectly good question. 
we looked at uh, switches, um, a little bit at switches. Uh, you know, for those of you who've never seen a switch, you know, showed you what it looks like, what those terms all mean. For example, when you look at an extreme network switch, um, what what those terms mean, the different ports, the different numbers, and those things. So that's important for you to know. Um, important for you to know as well. Another concept we spoke about was power over Ethernet. How you can power on devices like switches, like access points, just by using a power over Ethernet switch, a switch that is capable of not only providing network connectivity, but also providing electrical power. Just think about that phone. If you're sitting in an office, you probably have a phone on your desk. If you, if you look on the back of the phone, you'll see there are no power plugs on there. There's just an Ethernet cable. If that phone is working with an Ethernet cable, you know about power over Ethernet. You can say, yeah, I know that. That, uh, that phone is getting its power over the Ethernet cable, the same cable that's bringing data. And so it's important to know about power over Ethernet and the different standards as well and how much power that these standards uh, um, uh, provide. We then looked at um, layer two or one of the layers that we looked at layer two and and this was the kind of slide uh, that that kind of ties layer two uh, and shows you about all the different collisions and how the more traffic you have uh, how many you know more broadcast how things can slow down switching of course made a lot of these things a lot simpler um, because you, you're not broadcasting on every packet you still have broadcast for sure but switching has made a lot of this easier we kind of defined uh, broadcast and the broadcast domain we then went on to mac addresses we spoke about what a mac address is we said how Every device from your iPhone, your Android phone, from your fridge that talks to the Internet, how all of these devices have MAC addresses. And a MAC address is written in a particular way, hexadecimal. Binary, remember, is base 2, base 2, hexadecimal, base 16. And the first three parts of, of the, uh, the MAC address, that's the identifier. That tells you the manufacturer of that particular network device, right? And then that would be the address. So we kind of looked at that. We spoke about what a broadcast address looks like in, in Mac, uh, in, a, in a Mac address, FFFF. Why? Because all of these are, are, are set to, to the equivalent of one in, uh, in, uh, in, in binary. So we covered that. We looked a little bit at the Ethernet frame, what an Ethernet frame is. And we said, well, an Ethernet frame has to have a destination MAC address. And this is on layer two, right? Remember, layer two is uh, needs MAC addresses because layer two devices communicate using MAC addresses on layer two. And so this would be within a segment, within your local area network. That's how the devices communicate with each other. They use MAC address so that's why you have the destination mac address the source mac address and of course things like payload padding etc etc so layer two is about mac addressing that's you know, of everything that you need to know about layer two if there's one important concept is the mac addressing layer two is about mac addressing we also spoke about forwarding tables how a switch starts to know right that 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 mac address is via a cable is plugged into port one on the switch right when the first time it communicates it does a broadcast and so it then gets to know that that port that that mac address is connected to me on port one so next time someone needs to speak to to that mac address the switch then knows it builds up this table this forwarding table it says ah okay that that MAC address, I've seen it on port one, so I'll just forward you through to port one. So that was the very important thing that we needed to know about layer two. Layer three was when we needed to talk outside the network, right? So this was the important one, when we needed to talk outside the network. Because many times you're in a network, you need to send to the printer, document to the printer, you need to talk to that printer. MAC address, it's internal. But if I need to send an email to somebody outside my network, if I need to go to an HTTP site like, I don't know, 
uh, you know, nandos.co.za or .co.uk or .com or ibm.com or something like that, it's outside of my domain. And so when the DNS resolves that address, then this layer three is where it determines, hey, this is not on the same network as, as internal. So it can't go, um, uh, this needs to go to the, to the router, to the default gateway, because from there it's going to go out. So this is where um, uh, this, this bit of magic happens on, on layer three. This is where we use IP addresses. So remember layer two, MAC addresses, layer three, IP addresses, okay, and the subnet mask in combination with subnet masks. This is how we we figure out that it's that this the destination for this packet is not internal; it's external. So, with these IP addresses, there's the subnet mask uh, that we that we had spoken about, and over there you see the example of the one 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 that being the subnet mask and we're getting it from from that. So if the IP address is different, it generates a different subnet mask, and that's how we know, ah, this IP address is outside the network, send it to the gateway, the gateway will then know how to get it out and send it across the, uh, the routers. So we saw layer two, MAC addresses, layer three, IP addresses. We looked at, uh, uh, you know, packet headers, you know, versioning the total length protocols, the checksum, you know, source IP, destination IP. These are the types of things that you saw. And then you saw this slide where we showed how a packet, when sent to a destination, how it's going to go through, hit the internal address of the, uh, the, the router, the internal gateway that gets translated to the external address and then how it goes across this way. So it comes down this way goes across the network and it comes up and pops in the other way <coughs> and in there we saw routing tables and, and and that type of stuff layer four this was the defining slide about layer four and this was the slide that that showed you the difference between tcp and UDP, right? Uh, UDP, uh, we said, was a, 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 a stateless protocol, and TCP uh, is a stateful protocol, meaning we send a packet and we get a confirmation and acknowledgement. We send a packet, you know, uh, oops, we send a packet, a data packet across the network, and we get an acknowledgement. So for every packet that we send, we get an acknowledgement, or for every bunch of packets that we send. And this way is like using, that. we related that to a courier. If I really want something to get down to my friend in South Africa, I'm going to send it via a courier, because they're going to hand it to him, and they're going to sign off. But not all communication is like that. Some communication is UDP. And all I do is I just send the packets back. Less overhead, faster, because it doesn't wait for the acknowledgement. And if I miss a packet, if I... It doesn't, it just keeps going, okay? So we spoke about that and, and the different ways, the different ports um, uh, as, we, as we communicate it. Um, I think that there's a slide here. Yeah, there's a slide over there that shows you, and you saw previously the TCP, uh, you know, IP header. And look at the difference over here. For UDP, just the source port, destination port, length, and a checksum. That's it. You know, um, very, very, uh, very, very uh, easy. When you hit <clears throat> a, a server on the other side, we spoke about this a little bit, and there was also I think GT Hill has a video on the uh, on the on the YouTube uh, YouTube where he talks about uh, uh, no, it's not GT, it's actually me. I do a, a video on a a, a three-way handshake. Okay, um, the three-way handshake where the client device sends a syn a synchronized packet, the server responds with a syn act act standing for acknowledgement, and then my device acknowledges that, and when that three-way handshake is done, then there's the HTTP request and, and response. And this goes on and on and on while all this page is going and you're loading this page and you're going backwards and forwards. All of this is happening until finally my client sends a fin packet. I'm, this session is now finished and you get an acknowledgement from the server. It's also finished and that session is torn down. So absolutely fascinating how we look through that. 
we used the example of Instagram and we looked at uh, how the OSI model is applied to when I want to send a post on Instagram, right? And we kind of looked how if if I need to send, you know, uh, if I need to send a post, the first thing that needs to happen is DNS. DNS needs to, uh, you know, to, to happen on layer one, the application layer, and its job is to, hey, where is Instagram.com? It's no good knowing Instagram.com. I need an IP address. So it goes and it gets the IP address for that. And once that IP address has been created, then this can be filled in. The destination IP address can be filled in. And once I've got the destination IP address, layer three has already told me it's outside my network. I can communicate and I set up a SYN and a SYNAC with the Instagram server three-way handshake, bam, and that post goes out and a few seconds later it appears. We also had a look at this which was fascinating and that is you know that um, if you create a video, I actually saw this the other day, um, um, I, I created a video of snow, it was snowing in Cambridge <clears throat> and so I created this little video of the snow and I posted it to Instagram and when I did it I noticed that the quality on Instagram was really bad compared to, now I know I had filmed at 4k but when I looked at Instagram I almost wanted to remove my post because it looked so bad, why? Well, because Instagram is not going to allow me to put 4K video on there. It's going to compress it. It's going to compress it. And I've seen this with photos as well. If you take a very high resolution photo, Instagram is going to, is going to break that up and going to reduce the, the quality of that. And of course, that would be because in the application, there are limits. There are limits. We know, you know, you only have a one minute limit on Instagram of video that you can send. But it, if, if you have a large image, a photo that you want to post on Instagram, that's not all going to fit into one packet, into one frame. It's going to have to be broken up. And so we covered that um, over here, how it would be broken up into, into different frames to be able to send out that particular photo. We then looked a little bit at wireless networks. We covered them in a bit of detail. We looked at the different generations of them. Uh, 802.11x, also known as Wi-Fi 6. So we, we looked at that in, in a little bit of detail. I think we did that uh, that last week. Um, we spoke about the different you know capacities. Uh, you know, look at look at that. The maximum data rate, right? 9.6 gigabits per second. You know, and, and that was the. Remember, these are the theoretical limits. 11 megabits per second the first uh, the first generation so this is important to know I'm pretty sure you're going to get exam question um, on that we spoke about the different frequency bands right 2.4 which is the most crowded uh, one uh, at the moment there's just so many millions of devices that operate on that 2.4 we spoke about the technologies that support that but we also said that we have five gigahertz right five gigahertz much less crowded than that and in the u.s for example they've already opened up six gigahertz spectrum um, as well we got to terms with some of the terminology around wireless LAN, like the distribution system, what it is, you know, intrusion prevention system. We, we, we got, uh, you know, our head around ESSID, also called SSID, um, um, you know, uh, or when your friends come to your house and they know nothing about it, they just say, give me the password for your network over here correct them and say for my SSID my SSID is called guest so we kind of looked at that we looked at basic uh, service sets um, uh, as well we looked further a little bit at um, um, at wireless and we said that essentially wireless is using exactly the same protocols right as everything that we saw in wired it's exactly the same it's 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 still going through that osi model it's still going from layer seven to one nothing has changed if anything when we get to the physical layer right layer one where in wired networks we had a 
physical cable, a piece of copper that goes from one location to the next in wireless from you to that access point, from you to the access point, we use radio, right? We use radio. That's the only difference, but it's still all about uh, contention ratios. It's still about collision domain. It's still about that OSI model, right? It still follows exactly the same thing. We're still obsessed with changing those zeros and ones into sine waves, um, and they're going to go across uh, radio. Um, we, we spoke a little bit, and we spoke about interference, how the 2.4 is really busy. Um, we, we did talk about how we measure this is important. I would definitely suggest that this is going to be in the exam, especially the rules of threes and tens. Um, 3 dBm gain, power doubled. 3 dBm loss, power halved. You have, to, you have to memorize that. You have to know that. And you have to know this as well. 10 dBm gain, power increased 10 times. 10 dBm loss, power drops by 10 times. This is important. This will be in the exam. I'm totally convinced of that. Signal to noise ratio. We spoke about how this um, how this relates to a classroom. Uh, you know, teaching kids. I can talk at this volume, right? And because it's silent inside here, it's absolutely okay. But if I had um, if I had a classroom of kids, I would need to raise my voice because there's a lot of background noise. So we understood what signal to noise ratio (SNR). We looked a couple more, you know, interferences, different devices. Then we spoke about terms like attenuation, absorption, for example. We said that in a particular medium, you know, there's always going to be a natural loss of signal strength. We spoke a little bit about signal uh, loss, free space, free space path loss. And what this was about is in your house, you have a lot of objects, walls, and lots of things where the radio might be bouncing off. But in free space, if you go to a football field and you put up an access point, your signal is going to travel a lot more. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't, it, it loses strength as it, it goes. Even in free space, it loses some strength. We also showed this slide, which was the like most colorful of all slides, but just shows how um, uh, when you have an access point, the further you are, the less signal strength you're going to get. And because the signal strength becomes weaker and weaker, you might find that your that the speed of the connection drops so that it prioritizes connection other than speed. It's more important for you to be connected than have the then prioritize the fastest speed in in uh, in this case. And we see that because we know when we go to certain areas, the signal gets really, really slow. It's still there, but oh, it's so slow. And you move two meters and suddenly it's a lot faster. Why? Because of the interference. You, you stepped into one of those zones where the signal is, is stronger. So we spoke about why some devices they advertise such huge performance and gains but at the end of the day you don't really get that and we kind of covered the reasons you know why that that would happen we looked a little bit at um, um, you know um, uh, how you can connect going from one to the other across networks and, and that was you know really interesting um, this was kind of the, the 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 big slide for the internet where we spoke about uh, the internet being just a network of networks made up of a network of networks and then we we introduced this term called autonomous systems how we said that the internet is not just owned by one organization it has one body that you know uh, I can that oversees all the regulatory issues and the technological issues that make the internet work but in every country there's dozens of organizations that all contributing to making this this big whole work 
and we call these systems autonomous systems and we spoke about how they all have these different uh, numbers that are assigned to all of these different autonomous systems in different countries we we touched a little bit on routing protocols and this is you know that that homework that i gave you the the uh, shortest path first or open shortest path first invented by this guy called uh, dijkstra i if I really encourage you, if you haven't watched that video, go and watch it. It's on the materials tab, uh, homework number, uh, homework session five. There's a URL there. Go and watch that. If you watch that, you will understand OSPF, open shortest path first. You will all also understand how your GPS works, right? And that'll be like, wow, I didn't understand this. Now I get how this thing uh, works. So these are the, just the different types of routing protocols um, that exist. So we kind of spoke briefly about that. We didn't cover that in much detail. We looked a little bit at the Instagram post, how, you know, how it goes, and it will go through a different number of these autonomous systems on its way to its destination. So it's not just going to go from you to your ISP and then one big hop, you know, to Instagram. It's, it's not going to work that way. It's going to go through various autonomous systems. We even saw one of the tools that you can figure out that you can see, you know, the different routes that a, that a packet is going to take. We spoke about some of the uh, the protocols that work uh, um, on the web uh, on the internet something like the world wide web we spoke about urls right and what they mean and what a url is and uh, you know we broke it up into the protocol that part there the protocol and then the host name and then the domain name and that of course would be you know the resource that you are looking for we attributed that and said that is the FQDN, the fully qualified domain name. So that might appear in the exam for sure. But, you know, go do a, some research on URL, you know, so that you know when you look at this, you now know it's not just, you know, a website. It's a URL and it means something and it stands for something. So get into that we spoke about http right what it stands for um we also looked not only at http https which was the secure not the plural but the secure version of http that's the thing when you connect to your gmail or your instagram or your bank for example uh even you know extremes website it's https secure secure connection we spoke about another protocol, FTP, file transfer protocol, things like Dropbox, when you when you want to share a large file, you know, with your friend, with your mate or, or from, you know, from a from a big server or something like that. You're going to use a file transfer protocol to be able to do that. We spoke about email protocols, S. MTP, remember SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, also POP post office protocol we spoke about those and the different ports that they use smtp uses port 25 pop uses port 110 these are important things for you to um, for you to know we spoke about ping which is an icmp protocol um, and you know i gave you that little command if you type something like you know go into your command cmd for those of you on windows um, uh, you know you can type ping and ping google.com and you're gonna get an answer and every one of you will probably get different answers because you all in different countries different locations okay um so that that was uh, that was important trace route this was that command i told you that shows you the routers that you're going to go through um you know so you know um trace route to google.com and you see you know the different the different uh the different hops that it goes before it gets to the 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 location so we looked at all of those things then we looked about uh management <clears throat> So we looked at different management networks are critical to business and we did this last week, right? We spoke about why managing networks is important. We spoke about this FCAPS, you know, terminology, fault configuration, accounting, performance and security, how you think about managing networks. And we said it's important because 
at home you might have just one device, maybe two computers, maybe an iPad, that's all you have. There's not a lot of management on there. But imagine managing a hotel, uh, managing uh, a hospital, a university, right? Just because you expand and put in another 20 access points, you don't want to hire another 30 people. It's just too much money. How these things are important and how the management, the cheaper you can make it to, to manage, how the advantage that you get because it becomes cheaper to manage a complex networking system. And I showed you uh, how um, things like the, 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 the management uh, protocols like SNMP, Sierra November, Remember, Mike Papa, a simple network management protocol, how it uses agents, right? So every networking device from an access point, from a printer, from, from a switch, from a router, they all have these, these concepts of a MIB, management uh, information base, where they hold information in them about the functionality of that device. And they have agents on them so that you can query them with an SNMP application. You can ask things of this device. How are you running low on paper and you send or are you running low on toner and you send it a request and it responds and it says yes I am or no I'm not. We spoke about traps as well. So you set up a trap and and the trap will say, when I'm running low on tone, I will send you a message. And so we saw how SNMP, the different versions, have uh, how there's been an evolution and how SNMP is what we use nowadays mostly because it's secure and private, etc., etc. So I encourage you to go learn anything about MIBs, not Men in Black. So do a search. Wikipedia's got good articles on this. By the way, someone asked, there was a question last week, a poll question that came up and said, how many objects does uh, do, do the MIB2 uh, um, standard define? And the answer is 185 objects. That's how many things that you can have. So theoretically, a printer could have 185 uh, data points. How much paper I have, how much A4, how much A3, how much toner of the four different toners that I have, uh, how many pages I've printed, how long I've been online. It could have 185 data points on it. We then spoke a little bit about the structure of, uh, of an MIB tree, what it looks like. And we kind of, you know, understood we went a little bit over that. And then we kind of ended up with, um, with looking a little bit at Extreme Solution, the XIQ, Extreme Cloud IQ. And we saw about the regional and local data centers and how um, our solution adheres to GDPR standards and things like that. And how data is held within specific regions to conform. And so we saw how... By having uh, management set up in the cloud, how it's easy for you to have a distributed enterprise, you know, uh, branches across the entire world. But from one location, from one pane of glass, you have visibility into all of these things. And you can do whatever you want on there. You can, you can push policies for different countries, different opening hours. We use the example of different opening hours. Um, you know, you switch off your wireless access after hours. You can do so many different things from one pane of glass without having to have experience expensive IT people, expensive IT consultants to do this for you, you can manage all of this centrally and therein lies the power of a tool like XIQ. So I hope that even though this was really short overview, I, I don't do it justice and I, I do apologize for that. But I hope that that has kind of cover the areas that you should review. The videos are there for you to go and watch. Um, uh, I'm sure the guys on the chat will just you know put put again the uh, the link to the extreme uh, networks uh, URL. Um, Rowan, if you don't mind doing that, just um, um, you know put the URL on the chat so that everybody can can see uh, to extreme networks. You can go and watch those videos on YouTube, or you can go and watch them on Vimeo as well. Rowan, you can also chuck in the uh, the Vimeo one so people can go and watch it. There's a lot of resources online. 
Um, next week, as you know, um, is 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 the final session that we're going to do. I don't think it's going to be two hours, but it's a final session. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be fun. Um, so please come back uh, for that. Um, we will then open up the the exam for you uh, to go and uh, and do. That's going to be exciting as well. We're looking forward to seeing all of you guys going online and uh, doing your exam and then getting your certification. We're looking out forward to you guys going on your LinkedIn profiles and saying, you know, Extreme Network Associate. Oh, that's going to be so good. I'm going to be so proud of that. Thank you once again for watching. Thank you for being part of this, for making this a success. Tell your friends about it. Come follow me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, you know, happy to to engage. Thank you for spending time with me and with the team. I want to say thank you as well to the team <clears throat> for supporting us. Uh, for everybody on the on the chat who's uh, been answering questions and been so cool. Thank you for this great community that's been building up over here. Cheers and have a really great week. Thank you.